Um, who've at various points held policy positions and dealt with many of the questions raised this morning from the point of view of governments. Uh, with us, we have uh, Dr. Sidney Weintraub, Ambassador Rubens Barbosa from Brazil, and Dr. Luz Maria de la Mora from Mexico. Without further ado, uh, we'd like to start uh, the presentation with Dr. Sidney Weintraub. I guess it's on. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll try to be very brief, and if, if, if I'm not beginning to close after about 10 minutes, let me know uh, so that so things can be said. I want to raise some questions that were not raised in the first panel or were alluded to and not, and not discussed much further, and also countries that were omitted. The discussion focused an awful lot uh, on the southern cone to not Chile, Peru in any event, Argentina, barely touched on Mexico, which is an important trader, maybe the biggest trader uh, in Latin America, and it really didn't touch on Brazil, the most important country in Latin America. Uh, uh, and I want to talk a little bit, I'll stick to, I'll stick to to Mexico and some of those points, and uh, let, let Rubens Barbosa speak about Brazil. He knows that better than I do. Let me make some points first about the, uh, the financial collapse and how countries were affected by the financial collapse. The paper written by, uh, uh, that was referred to, uh, by uh, Arturo Posichansky, I think you referred to it, uh, is an excellent paper, but he was talking about financial issues. That whole paper really deals with financial issues. It didn't deal uh, too much with trade, didn't deal with GNP, uh, GDP, uh, and on financial issues, Latin America did come out pretty well. I mean, there's no doubt about it. His paper is worth reading, uh, those of you who haven't read it. Even Mexico came out quite well on financial issues. They, they, the one strength that Mexico has and the one strength they wanted to maintain because they think that's essentially its future is financial. Uh, uh, Mexico... Uh, does have a lot of free trade agreements all over the hemisphere, all over the world. I don't know who has more, Chile or Mexico these days. I've stopped counting. Chile. Chile does? Yeah. Um, <laughs> what? A little bit. Chile has um, 15 and Mexico has 12. Okay. But a lot of them, and, and with some pretty, uh, pretty important countries. But Mexico is different from the other countries. China is not a benefit to Mexico. China is a problem for Mexico. It's a problem for Mexico, one, because of its cheap labor. Two, uh, China keeps its, its currency pegged to the dollar, uh, and it's undervalued. In other words, I, uh, I, think it's, I think it's disgracefully undervalued. In other words, if I were making U.S. policy, uh, I'd, I'd make that a tremendous issue because the, the imbalances are enormous. But in any event, uh, Mexico has to compete with that country. About 80% of Mexico's exports are manufactured goods. And about 80% of their total exports, not just the manufactured goods, but also ooh, the less than 10 percent that go for oil come to the United States. So Mexico was deeply affected uh, by the, by the intra-industry arrangements that exist at the border, and they are quite important. I don't think China could compete with Mexico in that particular area because of proximity and the number of times that goods pass back and forth between Mexico and the United States before they become final products. I don't know what the, uh, what the decline in GDP in Mexico will be this year. They seem to be picking up a little bit in November, maybe in December, but it's probably going to be about 7%. Uh, 
this year in Mexico, maybe a little less than that. And it'll be bigger than any other country in the hemisphere. In other words, Mexico is both the biggest trader in the hemisphere. It's the one that suffered the most uh, in GDP. It suffered very, very severely in trade with the United States, uh, where, where much of the trade goes. Uh, and uh, in a sense, uh, it has to sort of figure out how they're going to come back again, which I assume they, uh, they will next year. Uh, I, there are trade negotiations going on between Mexico and Brazil. Now, I don't know just how far they've gone. Uh, my colleague here might want to know. Uh, but to speak about the hemisphere without speaking about the two most important countries in the hemisphere doesn't tell me much about integration at all. Uh, uh, in, in other words, I don't, I'm not sure we know much about the integration process in the hemisphere if we leave out the two most important countries. Uh, uh, and each of them does have trade agreements uh, within the hemisphere. Uh, the, I guess, what I, what I guess I wanted to do was, was keep in mind uh, the size, the size of, of, of what's going on in the various places. Let me talk about a point that was raised by uh, oh, almost as an afterthought towards the end uh, by Roberto Vusas, uh, which is an important point, that talking about Latin America is a very difficult thing. I don't really know how to talk about Latin America. They're so different. Uh, you've, let me just look at some of the regions and how different they are. Uh, you, have, you have the problems in dealing with the United States and also conflicts between uh, some of the countries and the others, Colombia and Venezuela, uh, is one important point that way. Uh, Bolivia, uh, Bolivia is allied with Venezuela. Uh, Bolivia is not doing well because it has some resources to do. Venezuela is not for doing very well. Uh, Ecuador is not really uh, allied with the rest of the hemisphere. In other words, speaking about the Latin America, as several of the speakers said in the last session, is a complicated issue. And I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it except by disaggregating as to which countries do what, which countries trade where, uh, which countries are important traders, and which countries suffered most and which suffered least. Uh, the, I suspect that what's going to happen in Mexico will be a modest recovery. It already started in November. I think it'll be, pick up again in, further in December. And for next year, I expect Mexico will return to positive growth of about 2.5%. What happens to Mexico also matters a good deal in Central America. And the only real discussion about Central America we had is that it's not really implementing uh, all of the things that it should do under CAFTA, and that's true. Uh, but I think you'll see a lot more, a lot more of that implementation as Mexico uh, begins to do better uh, in its own economy. Uh, as I said, I think Mexico uh, makes, an, uh, makes their finances a big, big aspect of their total policy, because that's the one thing that's, that really has going for it, and that's the one thing that brings in foreign direct investment. I don't remember the amount this year, but it's not been bad, given what's been happening in the Mexican economy. Uh, and the trade and the trade to the United States is uh, is, is picking up again. Uh, I, unlike some of the rest of you, I've been most unimpressed by the integration in Latin America since the 60s. In the 60s, when Latin America integrated. Latin American Free Trade Association. That wasn't integration for trade promotion. That was integration 
or put it differently, that was protectionism cloaked as integration. The idea was to, was to make the protectionism as widespread in the hemisphere as they could, rather than country by country. And that didn't begin to change until much, much later than that. Uh, first, when NAFTA introduced uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of integration, and then what the hope was uh, that Mercosur, in addition to being a political institution, might well become a, an economic institution with trade. Uh, it still hasn't done that. Uh, I don't know if it will. And the Brazilian admission of, uh, of, or deciding that they can go ahead with admitting Venezuela, I think emphasizes that they see it as a political institution uh, much more than a, an economic institution. I'll sort of stop there because I think I've made my point that, that, that the two big countries are important players. If they don't really get involved with integration deeply, it won't go very far except for the continuation of the spaghetti ball. They, I missed the discussion of that, but I think everybody knows uh, what that is. Uh, and that nature of the integration in Latin America you know, has its motives. People want to trade, but it's not terribly progressive. I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Ranger, Ambassador. Good morning, and thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, having listened uh, carefully what has been discussed here, I, I, I'll try to be as provocative as I can remembering my times here in, in Washington. Uh, seen from uh, a policymaker uh, perspective, uh, I have a few, a few comments uh, on uh, regional integration and the current situation after the crisis. First, we discussed here this morning economic and trade integration. And I think that uh, we have to be more alert to other kinds of integration that are taking place in, in the region, and I'll, I'll mention this uh, after. Second, it was mentioned here, since the beginning of the 90s in Brazil, we don't consider, in terms of integration, Latin America. La Latin America doesn't exist, no longer exists. And for those of you who don't know, Latin America was a term coined by a French sociologist to justify Maximilian in Mexico. It's a cultural thing invented by the French that uh, included the Caribbean countries. You remember that until the 70s, I think, Latin America included the Caribbean countries. So it doesn't mean much. And uh, we in Brazil, in the Foreign Service, and now in the government in general, uh, in terms of integration, we see three different uh, areas. North America, the NAFTA countries, Canada, Mexico, and the United States. Central America and Caribbean, also uh, integrated with the United States, uh, with the CAFTA, Caribbean Basin Initiative, and South America. This is the reality, and this is what multinational companies think when they analyze and they prepare their programs to, to the region. They don't think in Latin America. Very few companies think in Latin America. Only in political terms, in cultural terms, the, the, the concept exists. In Brazil, we not only approved this, but we took the consequences. And uh, when I was in the government, we did that. Uh, the first agreement signed by the Brazilian government with a South American country in which the word Latin America doesn't appear, it was the agreement, uh, the gas agreement between Brazil and Argentina. I was instrumental, I was the negotiator, and I made sure to include South America instead of Latin America. So this is the first uh, point. When, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, regional integration agreements, we have NAFTA 
CAFTA, Caribbean Basin Initiative. These are, are regional uh, trade agreements with the United States. So the United States is part of the regional integration when you, we talk about uh, Americas. Then you have South America. You have FTAs, as it was mentioned here, with Colombia, with Peru, with Chile. You have another area that was not mentioned here that is becoming increasingly important because not only because of the uh, trade cooperation but because of the agreements as well is Asia, the Asian uh, Association. Uh, th three countries have agreement, uh, Mexico, uh, Peru, and Chile uh, with, with them. And then you have other uh, regional agreements. Mercosur, you have uh, the the Andean uh, community. You have ALADI, the, the, the regional trade organization in Montevideo. They are discussing a free trade space there that is going nowhere. And you have a new association there that is ALBA, you know, with the six or seven countries, with the Venezuela. Uh, and uh, this, is not, this was not mentioned. This is the political part of the regional integration. It's the new new integration mechanisms that uh, exist. And I'm surprised that nobody here mentioned this because uh, from uh, f seen from the U.S. point of view, this is relevant because it excludes the United States. Now, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting that uh, in the whole morning nobody mentioned this here in, in, in Washington. You have UNASUL that was created. It was originally a Brazilian idea to have a trade, free trade area in the region. And uh, this uh, idea was kidnapped by Chavez that transformed it in, the, in UNASUL. And UNASUL is, uh, to begin with, South American countries with the possibility of expanding with other uh, countries in the region without the United States. And we cre the, the, the UNASUL created already uh, 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 defense council and a drug uh, council without the United States. So I think that uh, when, when we discuss integration, regional integration now, uh, a, a, a number of uh, 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 new perspectives uh, are, are there. Uh, first, you can't discuss regional integration uh, in, in the region without take into consideration the new political, economic, and social developments in, the, in, the, in, in each country of the area. Because this, the new situation, and I'm thinking about what is happening, uh, the social movements in Bolivia, Ecuador, Venezuela, uh, the, the differences between countries, Colombia, uh, Venezuela, Chile, Peru, Argentina, Uruguay, uh, and other aspects. The new situation is responsible for the disintegration. What we are experiencing in the region is not integration, it's disintegration. And uh, a different ag agenda is being uh, proposed and is being developed. And, uh, and protectionism in terms of trade is developing. You see the case of Argentina uh, in relation to Brazil and, and others. This is the first point, uh, the new situation in the region. If you don't understand the changes, you don't understand, you don't understand what's going on there and what is the new uh, uh, situation of the United States. I will I'll mention this later. Second. You cannot, you cannot uh, uh, discuss uh, uh, integration in the region without taking into consideration the position of Brazil, the expansion, uh, Brazilian expansion to the world. And uh, we hope that this now is for sure. Uh, the, those of you who read the, the survey in The Economist, you're reminded that uh, we Brazil, we had experienced different moments as good as this one. And Argentina as well. I remember in the 90s, Argentina 
uh, had the, exactly the same situation that Brazil has today. Investment uh, stories all over the world. And uh, Brazil uh, had, uh, uh, his, uh, had in, in history uh, failed. Uh, and we hope that uh, uh, the future of the country of the future this time will be different. And if the future it will be different, so the, the region will be different. I mean, Brazil is over 50% of South America in every, in every, in, in the most important uh, regards, you knowing the population, in territory, whatever, in trade, whatever. So, and the market. The third point that uh, should be taken into consideration is the presence of China. Uh, this was mentioned here. And at the end, someone pointed out this, the, the real situation. It's not an old-fashioned, old-style uh, approach to the problems, uh, to the, the trade uh, uh, with the region. It's a very practical, a very intelligent way of doing business. And uh, China today is the first, the second, or the third partner to all countries in the region. In the case of Brazil, coming from nowhere, five years ago. This year, Brazil, uh, China overtook Argentina and became the second largest trading partner with more than half of the trade with the United States. And in, in five years' time, probably they will overtake the United States because I think that the demand from China will continue to be the engine for the trade with the region. And they are, very, they, they, they are doing in Latin America less than what they are doing in, in Africa or in uh, Asia, in other, in other countries. But they are, very, they are very pragmatic. And from the point of view of Brazil, this is fine. For the first time in many years, this year, uh, ag products will be number one overtake, overtaking uh, manufactured products. And China, China uh, had, had to do with that. And, uh, the, the development that Brazil had uh, this year, and uh, uh, contrary to most of uh, Latin American countries, Brazil will grow this year, it will be very small. And uh, Brazil didn't go six, seven points below zero because of China, because of trade and uh, uh, investment of China uh, in, in Brazil. So the presence of China, the economic, the trade presence of China, not the political, the political uh, aspect of China, because China has, is not showing the flag here in, the politi in political terms. They have only 300 policemen in Haiti in the, ma in the UN mandate. It's not a, a, a individual policy. It's, it's within the framework of the United Nations. The fourth point is to understand the, the difficulties uh, to expand trade with Europe and the United States. I, 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 I don't agree with the view that uh, uh, Brazil doesn't want to have a, a free trade agreement with the United States. The United States don't want to, to have an agreement with, with Brazil. This is the reality. And I was in, uh, one of the negotiators in the FTAA until 2003, and we knew that the United States was not prepared to sign a trade agreement with uh, with Brazil, and uh, and Brazil is not not is also not interested, because as it was said here, Brazil has a def has an offensive uh, position now in terms of uh, foreign trade, and the United States cannot deliver, as we see today because of the situation in the Congress, what Brazil ne needs to negotiate in terms of agriculture. With the European Union, the same thing. We are about to ne start negotiating a free trade agreement with the United States, with, the, with Europe. Uh, and I don't think that uh, this agreement will go anywhere. Because the U.S., the, because the European Union, Brazil, or Mercosul agenda, is the same as the Doha Round. Opening of industrial and services in Brazil against uh, opening of agricultural products uh, in Europe. Europe cannot deliver either. 
And Brazil is not going to open unilaterally without uh, uh, concessions. The fifth uh, 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 point is the uh, uh, Doha round. Brazil bet everything on the Doha round, and we failed. And uh, in the last eight years, seven years, a, we, a year to go to finish the, the Lula's uh, mandate, Brazil didn't negotiate a single trade agreement. Instead of uh, uh, 40 or 50 uh, uh, Mexico or, or Chile, not a single one, to be precise, just one. With Israel, a very minor trade agreement, which is not uh, approved yet, not ratified yet in the Congress. So zero so far. Our trade jumped four times from 2003 to 2008. Now, before the crisis, we had $380 billion trade with $40 billion surplus. Now it dropped to the level of uh, 2007. Uh, Doha represented a, 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 a misperception uh, from the Brazilian government. The whole trade strategy was based on, this, on those negotiations, and we left behind free trade areas, uh, free trade agreements with countries in, in the area. And this is going to is going to uh, to change, I think, in the coming years. Another point that uh, has not been mentioned here, and I think is very important to understand the integration process. If Brazil succeeds, and uh, next year Brazil will be will be uh, growing above above six percent. Uh, if this happens on a sustainable basis, the market for the whole South American countries is Brazil. It's not the United States or Europe. It will be Brazil, and this will change the whole game in the region. And uh, in, this, in this respect, just to, to finalize, I also uh, uh, keep uh, hearing here in the state that uh, Latin America is anxious to, to, to have cooperation with the United States, the, the question of leadership of the United States. To be frank with you, as far as Brazil and most of Latin American countries are concerned, this is not an issue. Brazil is not worried about uh, the U.S. leadership. Brazil is not seeking advice from the United States. And most of the countries, and if you, if you remember that uh, the ALBA, Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Nicaragua, El Salvador, Honduras in the past, Cuba, they are against the United States. They are not in favor. They are not neut neutral. They are against the United States. You see that at least seven out of 34 countries have a, a position against the United States. In the case, in the case of Brazil, we're not against. On the contrary, we have a very positive relationship. The relationship is excellent. But Brazil profited or benefited from the absence or the lack of interest of the United States in the region. Two countries benefited most from the absence or the leave, gradual leave, of, uh, from the political point of view, and this is government. And from trade and investment point of view, this is business, this is companies. Two countries, China and Brazil. Those, uh, those two countries benefited most from the uh, current situation. And from the point of view of Brazil, Brazil has... 14% only of trade with the United States. It's not, uh, it's not uh, uh, 80% or 70%, 60%. 14% of trade with the United States. And China, now we have 11%, approaching quickly to overtake the United States. So uh, I, I, I meant to be provocative. I hope I did. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Maria, favor.
Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jose Raul. Thank you to the Woodrow Wilson Center and the Latin America Program for inviting me to this uh, seminar. It's always nice to be back at the center after being here during the summer. And uh, while I do feel very privileged to be able to discuss with you a very challenging topic, I believe, and um, I feel privileged to be part of, of uh, such a um, distinguished uh, panel and the discussion today. I would like to make some comments with respect in focusing on three main questions, just to structure a little bit of this discussion, because I do believe that there are many issues to tackle with respect to regional integration. First of all, I would like to be very brief and just mention what have been the effects of the current economic and financial crisis in Latin America. Second, um, how far has Latin America gone in terms of regional integration? I think that the previous panelists have been very eloquent with respect to that. We know that there is still a huge uh, road uh, in front of us. And if regional integration can actually help overcome this crisis. First of all, um, what have been the, the effects of the crisis in Latin America? Well, um, as it has already been mentioned before, the crisis in Latin America has been negative. It has had negative effects, but it has not been catastrophic. And I do think that this is a very um, important point, and it's different from what previous crises. The region has been able to show some resilience with respect to the effects that are coming from the external um, environment, the crisis, we imported the crisis into the region, uh, which is uh, something different from previous crises, and the region has been able to show a um, lot of strength uh, to, as a result of its um, better position in terms of solid macroeconomic fundamentals. The region learned from the past. Um, the region learned from the effects of the crisis in the 1980s, when we had a huge debt and banking um, instability, and also we learned from the 1990s in terms of the financial and banking crisis. So the region was um, in a better position to face the crisis when it appeared. Very briefly, what have been the effects of the crisis on Latin America? Uh, the, the bad news is that we have had um, we have really felt it. The good news is that the crisis has not been catastrophic. Um, some indicators that show the effects are, um, as it has been mentioned, GDP growth will roughly be uh, negative 2.5% in 2009. Um, basically, um, FDI inflows are expected to decrease by 30% uh, at the end of this year. Remittances will fall around 10%, and Mexico and Latin Central America have been the hardest hit as a result of the contraction in the U.S. economy and in the construction market. Um, there has also been a relative decline in terms of international price commodity, uh, commodity prices, I'm sorry, an average uh, decline of 30%. And this obviously has affected countries like um, Venezuela, Ecuador, and Mexico in their oil exports. Uh, Chile and Peru in their mineral and metals uh, exports, and agricultural exporters such as Brazil and Argentina that um, have these products as part of their most important products in their export basket. Um, on the other hand, international trade has also collapsed. Uh, the WTO expects that this year the contraction will be 13 percent, and in Latin America, according to the Economic Commission for Latin America, uh, the exports will decline by 13% and imports by 14%. And this is the worst performance for exports in 72 years and for imports in 27 years. Also, tourism has uh, had an impact, especially for countries like Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central America that uh, have an important dependence on foreign exchange coming from, from uh, tourism revenue. Um, and this uh, slowdown of the economy has obviously had an impact on in employment. There has been increased unemployment and the, uh, a growth in the informality sector because firms have uh, had to shut down, especially uh, small and medium-sized companies. Now, how do we uh, explain this resilience to the crisis? Well, um, Latin America had a very good um, had a, had a period of very good economic performance. Between 2003 and 2007, Latin America experienced the best economic growth in three decades, around 4.5% annual average growth. 
This was possible uh, also because there was fiscal discipline and sound macroeconomic management, which allowed, in general, for almost um, every country to have current account surpluses, flexible exchange rates. Uh, there was an, uh, a reduction of the external debt, and also the quality of the external debt improved in terms of longer terms for repayment and also um, lower interest rates. Um, foreign exchange reserves increased, and also some countries were even able to establish some stabilization funds. And the banking and the financial system in Latin America was um, in a stronger situation because it had already undergone some supervision and regulatory reforms. So all these conditions allowed governments in Latin America to adopt some anti-cyclical policies that uh, basically use fiscal policy and government revenues to either give tax breaks or to increase uh, government spending to give some dynamism to the economy. Also, external factors explain this resilience. As I was saying, high commodity international prices, increased remittances, and favorable conditions of external financing helped the region be in a better position. And countries such as Chile, Brazil, Peru, Colombia, and Uruguay well, were prepared to overcome the effects of the crisis. Now, against this backdrop of international finance, financial crisis, recession in developed economies, a slowdown a world economic growth, a slowdown in international trade, the stagnation of the WTO Doha round, and a lack of international liquidity and credits. The question is if regional integration is an alternative. And I want to go to my second question. How far has Latin America gone in terms of regional integration? Well, and uh, in this sense, I think that um, I'm just um, summarizing what has already been said in previous presentations. The history of regional integration in Latin America is really a history of expectations. Um, regional integration has been long in discourse, but very short in results. And what we see together is a region that is highly fragmented, where the project of regional integration is still to be um, thought of and delivered. And I do think that even um, our commitments outside the region as a country and as a region are normally deeper and are more binding than the commitments that we have decided to um, engage in among ourselves. We have a long history of integration that dates back to the 1960s, and after 50 years, unfortunately, we have very little to show. As uh, Roberto Bosas was saying um, already, he has already explained the stages of, of integration. We have today um, a number of economic integration mechanisms, regional, like for example, Alavi or Laftalaya. In Central America, we have the Central American Common Market that has made progress in terms of institutional development. The Andean community that suffered deeply from Venezuela's decision to withdraw, to keep itself. It's the, the uneasiness of Venezuela with the Andean community really uh, put a, a, a big blow on that uh, sub-regional economic scheme. CARICOM is still in the process of uh, developing institutional capacities. MERCOSUR has uh, evolved also into different forms of integration, not only MERCOSUR, but as was um, being mentioned before, UNASUR. And then we have uh, the FTAA that never happened, right? But at the end, we have a la lack of regional integration that comes down to 23% of the trade that we uh, do among each other, which is, which is high, uh, but it's very low uh, compared to the EU, uh, which is 67%. Now, um, this shallow regional integration, um, I think it's a result of many, many factors, but I do think that um, Latin American integration lacks a common vision and understanding with respect to what could be a regional integration project, what could be the benefits uh, for each one of the members of this project in terms of regional integration. There also needs to be a leadership, and by leadership I don't mean um, that you need to give advice to anybody. By leadership I mean that somebody needs to draw the process, either Brazil or Mexico. And uh, there, are, there has, 
been a constant in terms of bilateral conflicts. We are seeing many bilateral conflicts currently, but this is not new. This is something that has been um, present throughout decades. Now, as a result of this, what we have today are regional integration mechanisms that have evolved in very ad hoc way, ways and very weak mechanisms. For example, dispute settlement mechanisms are very uneven and sometimes they don't even exist. Aladi doesn't have a dispute settlement mechanism. And the institutional design of these regional mechanisms sometimes are made to even preserve protectionism. They're limited in scope or simply they are not observed. However, within the crisis, it is very important, I think, to avoid the protectionist trap. Uh, there is an NGO called Global Alert that says that since November 2008, when the G20 uh, got together, they, um, the, the presidents vowed not to establish any protectionist measure. And so far, this NGO says that there have been 400 um, um, protectionist measures established among the G20. Argentina, in, in Latin America, Argentina accounts for 20, Brazil for 11, and Mexico for 5. Now, what have been the alternative integration routes followed? In, in absence of a real regional integration, we have followed the bilateral route, which goes to uh, the FTAA route, and I want to correct myself here. Um, Chile has 21 free trade agreements with 57 countries. Mexico has 12 free trade agreements with 44 countries in the region. It has been an alternative, but it's not regional integration. At the sub-regional level, we see, for example, Mexico and Central America trying to negotiate a free trade agreement, the convergence of agreements, but this is not new. This comes from the early 1990s. We see the creation of the Foro del Arco del Pacifico among 11 countries, but it has no negotiating mandate. And outside the region, we are looking at Asia, either in APEC or bilateral free trade agreements uh, with Asian countries. And uh, the EU, Colombia, and Peru negotiating, and Mercosur also negotiating. Now, um, very briefly, I just want to mention that trade flows have also led to investment flows. and. Um, Integration has also been led by investment. Investment in Latin America has um, L Latin America has become also an investor abroad and an important investor in Latin America. For example, for last year, according to the uh, UNCTAD, Latin America invested $63 billion abroad, and most of it was invested in the region. Now, with the crisis, it is expected that the, the investment that Latin America does abroad will decline 20%. However, this investment may be an alternative to, as a financial source for Latin America. Now, the last part, and I promise I will be very, very brief, uh, can regional integration help overcome the crisis? Well, there is there's something that I think is very different from the past and very different from where, when the regional integration schemes were developed. Latin America today is more attractive as a market. And why it is more attractive? There's more political and economic stability. There are macro fundamentals that have been accepted by basically the majority of the countries, however they understand them. But it's understood that um, something has to be done in order to maintain stability. And that makes business um, more conducive to trying to do business. So as b mentioned before, the private sector can be a driving force in uh, promoting um, uh, integration. There's been progress in logistics and infrastructure, there's a solid banking system, and there is the possibility of having more policy coordination in international economic fora, in the development of the international economic architecture, or in innovation. However, what is missing? There needs to be a vision that is really conducive to regional integration. We need to see each other as partners. We need to rethink integration after 50 years. I do believe that there needs to be leadership from the two main economies in the region, Mexico and Brazil. They need to, to show political will. Mexico's economy is going to contract this year between 8 and 7 percent of GDP. Brazil is going to show us 0 to 1 percent growth in this year. And I do think that there are the two countries that can actually think seriously about the region and propose a new uh, agreement. Um, I'm going to skip this one. It was just talking about the lack of financial liquidity and higher credit costs, that there are alternatives to um, the, the lack of liquidity in the region. And this, this table, I only wanted to show it to you just to show the, the way of uh, both 
economies in the region. In terms of exports and imports, total trade, Mexico um, did 600 billion of trade last year and Brazil 380. So both um, Mexico and Brazil account for almost one trillion in terms of uh, trade. However, Mexico and Brazil only trade among the two of them around um, 20 billion dollars. Now, um, conclusion. Um, the crisis. The crisis, I do believe that it's an opportunity to reinvent regional integration. We do have to consider regional integration seriously. We need to bring credibility back to the process. We need to see each other not only as markets but also as partners driven by trade and also driven by investment. We also need to think about comprehensive integration, the old and the new paradigms, trading goods and services, investment, telecommunications, government procurement, infrastructure development, trade facilitation, and dispute settlement in its very different areas. Brazil and Mexico must be involved and they need to get together. And if, and it's, this is a big if, if there is the possibility of having a free trade agreement between Mexico and Brazil, I do believe that that's going to set really the, um, the background for further regional integration in the region. Regional integration is no short-term answer to this crisis, but in the long term, regional integration can help economic growth, can help export diversification, and can al also impinge on the competitiveness of the region. Thank you. Pardon. Thanks, Susma. Uh, we now open the floor uh, to take questions from the audience. There's a couple of microphones. Uh, if you could please identify yourself and uh, your institution. Carol Wise, University of Southern California. I don't have a question. I have a request. I would like Ambassador Barbosa to respond to this call for partnership <laughs> between Brazil and Mexico. Let me just, I just have to, actually, I, I have a couple of questions, and I want to take the moderator's prerogative to, to ask precisely Luz Maria, um, following up on a couple of points that she made. Uh, the first is, uh, I'd like you to, uh, it's basically to explore a little bit more the role of Mexico in all of this. Uh, just have a couple of questions. What lessons, if any, are there for Latin America in terms of the crisis based on what happened to Mexico, mm -hmm. being the one hardest hit in terms of uh, its trade profile and, and, and a couple of other indicators? And thinking about integration, is Latin America an alternative for Mexico, seen from a policy perspective? Mm. We're talking about further integration in the region, et cetera, but we're talking about Latin America looking towards China and, and uh, as a market for, for, for its exports, for investment, for a whole variety of, uh, of variables. How is Latin America, is Latin America an alternative, and, and how so or how not? Mm -hmm. okay. Who, um. We have a third question. Yeah, a couple of questions. Um, something that I would like to draw attention is about the relationship between macro issues and trade and the relationship between institutions and the, the problems uh, Latin America is uh, facing. Uh, and I would like to raise two points. First, it uh, has to do with uh, the possibility of uh, Dutch disease situations in, in, in our country, especially in the south, because of uh, trade specialization, and more specifically concerning uh, Brazil, because uh, it will be difficult for Brazil to, to manage the, the real exchange in, in the future, I think and especially because of the rising proportion of uh, trade with uh, China. And the, the second point uh, has to do with uh, the management of, the, of capital flows, because uh, we are going to face, for a period, a zero interest rate uh, world. And these are invitations to build bubbles. And we, <laughs> every, everybody is saying that Latin America is doing well, and I am afraid about that because uh, uh, when when we are when the rest of the world uh, perceive that we are doing well that the fundamentals are right, we build a bubble. So uh, this is uh, very very important from from my point of view and especially uh, for the South. And the third point has to do with institutions. Uh, natural resources uh, are associated with natural resources curses. Um, 
The point is that we have a lot of conflict about uh, natural resources and the rents of natural resources in Latin America. It has to do with these uh, political conflicts. And when you look at the, at, uh, the South, South America, with, uh, through these glasses uh, concerning uh, macroeconomic management, the management of capital flows, and the management of uh, co uh, social conflicts, associated with uh, natural resources, I think that the ability to manage this, that uh, I say Brazil as compared to Chile and Venezuela is very different. So this is also a source of heterogeneity in the, in the, in the South. Well, I'll try to make some comments from what we heard here. First, the question of the agreement uh, Brazil and Mexico. Now I am uh, part-time in a Federation of Industries in Sao Paulo. I had the Council on Foreign Trade there. Everybody agrees to, 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 to have a, 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 a trade agreement with, uh, with Mexico. Uh, we are even proactive. But the perception in Brazil is that uh, Mexico doesn't want to have an agreement. There is a huge opposition domestically, a huge opposition in Mexico. President uh, uh, Calderon went to Brazil two or three months ago, and he proposed to do this, uh, this agreement. And uh, we accept it because we are looking forward to it. But I am a bit skeptical. I think that uh, it, will be, it will be difficult because of the domestic resistance, uh, in Mexico especially. Uh, in relation to the, the uh, other point, the macroeconomic and institution uh, point of view, uh, related to the, to the uh, regional integration, uh, all the uh, negative aspects that uh, you see uh, in Latin America doesn't take place in Bra do not take place in Brazil. Uh, Brazil will be second to China in terms of inflow of foreign domestic investment. Uh, our our uh, exchange rate appreciated 50% since December in a year, nearly a year. And, uh, uh, and this creates a uh, problem, but uh, facilitates Im imports from uh, other, other countries. Uh, uh, I, I wrote a piece the other day, the, 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 a few, uh, two months ago, on the macroeconomic uh, 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 differences between Brazil and Argentina. And, uh, it is, it, it is uh, interesting to, to notice in the last 20 years, uh, the signals were different. When Argentina uh, uh, was expanding, Brazil was in, in trouble. When uh, uh, the uh, Argentinian uh, macroeconomic policies were orthodox, Brazil were with crazy plans, and now it's the reverse. So uh, we, we uh, I mean, uh, uh, th this is Latin America. And that's why I think that uh, uh, we have to consider a, a new approach to the regional integration uh, process. Because uh, if, if Brazil, in the next five, 10 years, grows at uh, 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 five, six percent on a sustainable basis, it's a new ball game in the region, despite the macroeconomic differences, despite the, the, the exchange rate uh, appreciation in, in Brazil. This will facilitate, because I am in favor of Brazil opening up for the South American countries, zero tariff, f f all of them. This will promote uh, a, a real integration in the, in the region. And I think that eventually it will come, will come to that, if not in all, uh, all items. Uh, substantial, substantially all trade will be, will be uh, free. Uh, because if you think, in the case of smaller countries, like Uruguay, if 
by a decision of the Uruguayan government. They decided to sell only to Brazil. The domestic product will be sold only to Brazil. Everything they have to sell doesn't reach Sao Paulo. Stays in the middle of the way because the production is small. That it's uh, what I'm trying to say is that those countries do not pose a threat to the Brazilian economy. There are segments pro with uh, uh, an idea that some restrictions will have to be created. Uh, but uh, Brazil now changed. Uh, Brazil is uh, 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 increasingly uh, an open country. We have 23% of our GDP in foreign trade, 23%. The United States, until recently, until 10, 15 years ago, was less than that. Today, the United States is 35, something like that. It was it, uh, big economies are normally uh, not very open, like uh, Korea. It's different. China is a different animal. But uh, Russia, Indonesia, the United States, Brazil, Russia, it's different. We will never be uh, open as... Korea, Taiwan, it, it's different. So uh, I think that uh, uh, from the institutional point of view, uh, w w w all Latin American, country, Latin American countries face a real problem in terms of management of the integration process. Because we had a proliferation of negotiations. We had multilateral negotiations in Doha round. Uh, uh, until 2003, not 2005, we had uh, the FTAA uh, negotiations. We have Mercosur. Now we have all this myriad uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, regional organizations. And even in the case of Brazil, we have a reasonably organized foreign ministry in, in charge of the coordination. Even in terms of Brazil, it's difficult to follow all this. Imagine other countries, smaller countries. They cannot cope with, uh, with this uh, negotiating process. This, this is a real institutional, institutional problem because uh, it's not, I'm not sp speaking about uh, weak institutions, and we can speak about that as well if we think that contracts are not, are not uh, honored or uh, disrespected uh, in most of the countries that to make an additional negative aspect for the integration in Brazil so suffered this in Bolivia and in, uh, in, in other countries so it's uh, uh, in terms of institution we if we, if we are we, we wait to have strong institutions I think that the integration process will have to wait for a long time. Thank you. Well, uh, the first question um, with respect to Mexico's experience with the crisis. Mexico is a case in which the Mexican economy is extremely dependent on the external sector, not only in terms of exports. Um, our trade um, accounts for 60% of our GDP. Uh, but we're also very dependent in terms of international prices of oil for government revenue. 40% of government uh, spending comes from oil. International prices of oil fell from 150 in July of 2008 to a current um, average $70. We're also very dependent on tourism. We're also very dependent on remittances. So our economy uh, had been growing very little, around 2% average. But when the crisis comes in, in the U.S. economy, what it reveals is the vulnerabilities of our economy and the fact that we were unable to shift the, the boat to the domestic market, to alternative markets, in order to give some dynamism to the economy. So what this shows is that um, it, it's, not, it's not bad that we are... Um, so integrated into the world economy. What is wrong is that when the, those external conditions are not conducive to economic growth, then we're in trouble because we have absolutely done nothing in 20 years to provide the reforms that we need to um, trigger 
productivity and productivity to competitiveness and competitiveness to growth. So it is more a question, I think, of um, having left all the burden of growth to the external sector, because in Mexico we're in a political gridlock. And for the last 20 years, we have been able to do some reforms, but not all of the reforms that we uh, require. And then when we have done the reforms, it has been also very difficult to implement them. We have some good laws, for example, in telecommunications. We have some uh, good institutions on the paper. But when it actually comes to the implementation of those laws, the competition is not there. So I think that what this crisis did to a country like Mexico is to open our eyes and realize that there are a lot of things that need to be done at home in order for us to be able to take advantage of the opportunities that are out there. Now, the second question is, is there an opportunity for Mexico and Latin America? I think that there's no question that there is an opportunity. And we have to put this in perspective. Of course, Mexico is linked to the North American market. Mexico is part of the NAFTA. Mexico is part of a productive integration in North America. And that has been positive because it has allowed Mexico to um, modernize its uh, industry, uh, modernize its uh, production, but also modernize its economic institutions, as Carol was saying, in terms of the regulatory framework. We need to give time for those regula regulations to actually deliver and to actually uh, perform. But in terms of opportunities with Latin America, there are two things that I want to say. First of all, Mexico has become a very important investor in Latin America. For example, in Brazil, Mexico is the number one Latin America investor with $17 billion with a whole host of companies from telecommunications, banking, retail, food, auto parts, um, electronics, house appliances, you name it, they are there. And the reason why they are there is because they cannot export. We cannot export from Mexico because you cannot, I mean, the Brazilian market is closed, right? <laughs> so if you cannot export, you should go and establish there. Why? Because it's a very attractive market. It's almost 200 million people and it's growing and it's, it's a very attractive market without a question. So that's why we are there. But Mexico has also started investing uh, heavily in many countries in Latin America, Central America, the Caribbean, Latin America, in a whole host of, of sectors. And also trade has increased among countries with, with, with which we have free trade agreements and also with countries where we do not have free trade agreements. It is a very uneven scheme in, in this sense. But uh, for example, we have free trade agreements with the five Central American countries. We have a free trade agreement with Colombia. Uh, we had with Venezuela until Venezuela withdrew from the G3. We have a free trade agreement with Chile, with Uruguay, um, and Bolivia. Um, but we do not have a free trade agreement with the most important re uh, economy in Latin America, which is Brazil, right? And I do believe that if we were able to go to a, a free trade agreement, which is not an easy proposition at all, we know that there is a history there. There's a strong history. Um, in 1998, President Cardoso decided not to renew the little trade agreement that we had between Mexico and Brazil because Mexico had become part of the NAFTA and Mexico had decided not to comply with its uh, um, commitments in Aladi of uh, automatically extending the preferences to the, the countries in the region except if there was a negotiation. In 1998 we tried a free trade agreement and it failed. In 2000 we tried again and it failed. So we had to um, come up with a very little agreement between Mexico and Brazil that covers 800 tariff item lines, which is basically 10% of the, of the tariff, which is nothing. And then we have an automotive agreement. But what is very symbolic about those agreements is that they have been able to trigger growth in terms of trade, the trade that the, they cover. Um, trade with Latin America be, uh, in Mexico is, uh, in 2000 it was around 3% of our total trade was with Latin America. Last year it was 6%. The, the base is low and the base will continue to be low, but there is room to grow. And I think that there is room uh, to, to create opportunities for, for Mexico and other countries in, in the region. And uh, last, um, just with respect to um, what, what was being mentioned about um, that we may build a bubble. I, I do think, and 
probably it's the optimist in me, but I do think that there is a change in how countries overall in general, probably I'm also making a very um, strong generalization for all the countries, but I do think that there is a sense that no matter what ideology we're talking about, we, there is an understanding that macroeconomic fundamentals need to be there in order to do the rest. And I do see that there is an awareness that is very different from what we had in the 80s or in the 90s with respect to how do we conduct our financial and our um, economic policies. I'm not saying that it will not happen, of course not. But I am a little bit more optimistic because I do think that that macroeconomic stability has yielded result for many countries in their different um, objectives, policies, and perspectives. No? So um, I want to think that there is a possibility, but we do need to think out of the box. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? Uh, Cindy? Sure. Just one last question before we break. Quick question to follow on with what Luz Maria was just saying. I was wondering if you could respond to Ambassador Barbosa's comment that in, uh, in Mexico there's strong domestic opposition mm -hmm. to a, mm -hmm. a, a stronger economic relationship with, uh, with Brazil. Is that, um, as in the case of Pemex, a, a certain sort of nationalism rooted in past decades, is there a fear of uh, uh, competitiveness from, from Brazil in the same way that there's a, a, a real and imagined threat from, um, from China? in uh, the manufacturing sector. I mean, what, who, among whom is this, is this opinion mm -hmm. held? Well, um, I think that it is not a Brazil question. It's a Mexico question. It's not, it's not that we decided, or the Mexican private sector has said, I don't want to negotiate with Brazil. It's that the Mexican private sector doesn't want to negotiate with anybody. And so it's not personal. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that there is um, some kind of, I don't know if to say backlash or identity crisis with respect to our position in the global marketplace. And very briefly, there has been, um, since the Fox administration, there has been um, questioning of why do we want these free trade agreements for? What do we want them for? And why do we continue to negotiate free trade agreements if uh, we have 12 free trade agreements with 44 countries in the world and nonetheless 80% of our exports go to the U.S. market, which is a valid question. But that, I think, goes back to uh, um, industrial policy, innovation policy, competitiveness, productivity. And it goes back to the possibility of creating those value chains that we need in order to promote an SME sector that can provide jobs in the country. But that question is not, will not be answered by negotiating or not negotiating free trade agreements. That's a very different question. But the problem is that instead of saying, okay, let's tackle the real issues in the Mexican economy that have to do with competition, with competitiveness, with productivity, with innovation, with education, let's shut down the, um, the door and let's continue to, rent, um, to, to be a rent-seeking economy which we are so far. No. <laughs> so it is, I, I think that the Calderon administration does have, um, does want to, to do this free trade agreement. I do think that there is a will in the, um, in the government, and that is important, to have the political will is very important to move things on. But the reason why the private sector finds it so difficult is that they think that if they open to Brazil, they will have to open to Korea, they will have to open to Singapore, they will have to open to Australia, to New Zealand. So it's a whole host of negotiations that are on the um, boilerplate and that we have not been able to answer. But I don't, the, ris the way it has been posed, it's very uh, comfortable for the private sector because it's like when you solve the competitiveness question, we will address the trade agenda, and I do not think that the, it's an either or. They can go 
together. But definitely there is a um, an identity um, dilemma in Mexico of where do we want to be in terms of integration with the global marketplace. And we have been successful in terms of negotiating 12 free trade agreements and so far we have lived from there, but um, the world is moving and it's not going to wait for us. Thank you very much for your presence this morning. Uh, please join me in thanking our panel. And uh, we will take a lunch break, and we'll see you back in an hour. Thank you.